It's U of L today on 93.9 The Ville. Here's your host, Mark Hebert. And welcome to U of L today with Mark Hebert. It's the show that's going to make you a little bit smarter and give you U of L fans some good news and interesting information to brag about. Happy Thanksgiving week, by the way, to everyone who's listening out there and uh, watching on uh, Metro TV. Uh, today's show, we've got a couple of uh, things that should be pretty interesting. U uh, of L is going to be doing some research on the space station. Yep, U of L sending some stuff up in space, and we're going to be doing some research on finding out how liquids like blood and detergent come apart in zero gravity. So we'll talk to the Speed School of Engineering professor about that research that he's doing. Also, the University of Louisville has received a big federal grant to study and implement ways to reduce youth violence in West Louisville. You'll hear some of that news conference with the mayor and the dean of the School of Public Health and some others. But first, what to do about kids who are angry, disruptive, and make trouble in the classroom. Two University of Louisville faculty members from the College of Education and Human Development are here to discuss that with us. They are Terry Scott and Justin Cooper. Welcome, gentlemen. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Thanks for being here. Appreciate it. All right. So you guys have studied this issue, and you look at kids that are disruptive and have some problems in the classroom. What have you found? That's a broad question. I'm just throwing it out there. You guys, uh, you guys tell us. Um, one, that it's not unique to any particular place. It's not unique to the United States of America. It's not unique to urban or rural. It's, it's across the board. We see it everywhere we go. Disruptive kids in the classroom? Yeah, absolutely. All right. So what do you do about it, Justin? Well, I think one of the big things we, we've seen over the last decade, a big shift in uh, how we approach this, we used to sort of blame the students. and There was always something wrong with the students. And now I think we take a more broad approach to it and try to figure out what proactively we can do to try to address their behavior before it becomes a problem. And, and a lot of that depends on teacher behavior and adult behavior. So there's much more of a focus on that now. And some of the things that you guys focus on, as I understand it, um, is um, getting those students to uh, pay more attention in school or try to be more active in their, uh, in their studies. So how do, you, how do teachers... You know, you got the kid in the classroom that always disrupts the class. Uh, how do teachers and what what things can they do and use to make that student perhaps uh, feel more confident in the classroom so he or she isn't disrupting the class? It, it's, it's really uh, a, a prediction issue. And what we're trying to do is figure out how could we predict with, with uh, the, the greatest possible certainty that a student would be successful in the future. And what we know is the greatest predictor of success in the future is success right now. So the teacher's job every day, every way is to say, what could I do right now to make that kid successful? Because that's the best predictor I'll have of the next success. So Justin and I spend a lot of times working with teachers on what are the simple things you could do when they first enter the room? What are the simple things you could do when you give a direction? What are the simple things you could do when a child looks like they're becoming frustrated? And what we want to do is say, it's not a sure thing, but there are probabilities here. If you, if you can engage kids positively as early as possible in any interaction, you've increased the probability of a positive interaction in the future. So a lot of it is just looking for those little openings where you can catch a kid doing it right or set them up to do it right. When you're talking, go ahead, Justin. You were gonna I was just going to say so much of it is, is highly predictable. When we talk to teachers and say, can you tell us if we come in here tomorrow, where will I see inappropriate behavior? Where do I need to be? What time do I need to be there? And what am I going to see? Teachers can tell you. And if we can predict it, we can, do, we can take steps to prevent it. And that's what it's all about, prevention. And Terry, you said early on you can find these things. Are we talking children in kindergarten and preschool that are, uh, you can determine this, that they're going to be disruptive <clears throat> in the classroom? Absolutely. We are actually very good at identifying kids with problem behaviors by about three years old, fairly reliably. And if we don't do something to change those problem behaviors at three years old, very quickly those problems get to the point where the probability of us changing them in the long run becomes very small. So it's not only early childhood, early intervention, although that's a part of it, but it's any time we see a kid starting to have problem behaviors, we need to intervene immediately to try to create a success. But that, yeah, early childhood, we see it there first. So what would, uh, parents who are listening to this, and they may have a kid that's, say, four or five years old in kindergarten, maybe struggling a little bit in school. They've heard from the teachers that little Billy was acting up. Um what do you tell those parents? What are some interventions that the parents can do, perhaps, before their child even gets in, in school to, uh, uh, to keep them under control? Or is that not your job? You're, you're, no, you're just once they get in school, that, that, and then you figure it out. It's all connected. It's all connected. So, I mean, we 
obviously on our end of it, we deal much more with the teachers and the education part of it, but it's all connected. And, and a lot of it is about consistency. You know, we like to see, you know, consistent discipline, consistent, you know, uh, the way we work with, with students in schools. We want to see parents working that way with them, too, to, to a certain extent. They're obviously not going to have some of the professional expertise, but, um, but so much of it is predicated on success, and we want our students to be successful. And that starts at home, obviously. So it's, it's, a, it's a, uh, very much a, a, a situation where we want the classroom success. We want students to be successful at home, too, in, in the way that we interact with them. Um, and it's all connected. So that's what we, I mean, to me, the big message is to, with parents is consistency. So there's really no difference between teaching kids to behave and teaching kids to read or do math, et cetera. So to parents or to teachers, it's what would you like that student, that child to do? Teach them to do that. Model it for them. Be very explicit. And then, like Justin said, be very consistent with how you continue to respond to that child while they're doing those things. Let them know when they're doing it right immediately and every time and let them know when they're doing it wrong. But doing it wrong is an opportunity to reteach to create that higher probability for success in the future. We're talking to Terry Scott and Justin Cooper from the College of Education at the University of Louisville. Um, once students are in classroom and they are, say, middle school grade, um, you hear a lot of parents come and say, there's a disruptive kid in the classroom, even in elementary school, there's a disruptive kid in the classroom. I just want that kid out of there. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's not helping my children's learning ability when I've got this disruptive kid in the classroom the whole time. So is it best to take that kid out of the classroom into some sort of alternative school or alternative learning environment? Or is it best to keep them in that classroom and have that teacher try and deal with them? Well, uh, or is it different it, for every scenario? It, it is different. It's, it's kind of a complicated question in that you do have to look at it on a case-by-case -case basis. Obviously, if there's, there's situations where students are in danger, uh, where somebody's exhibiting behavior that, that might harm somebody, we look at that differently. But overall, the big general message is that there's absolutely no evidence whatsoever that, that shows that removing students from the classroom is successful, that, it's, you know, that there's sustainability, that taking them out of the classroom will sustain behavior change in them. There's just no evidence whatsoever, and yet it's one of the practices we still see schools doing all over the country. It's not a Kentucky thing. It's everywhere. We take students out, and, and there's always a couple different ways to look at it, but if you do that, um, those students are somewhere doing something, and it's usually not you know, stuff that we want to see happening. So there's a better chance for success when we actually keep them in the classroom. Do alternative schools work? It depends on what you mean by work. <clears throat> well, do they produce, do they, do they produce um, A, an education for a kid who is taken out of the normal school classroom? That's the first thing it's, I think, intended to do. And secondly, does it change their behavior in any way? Um, uh, the research is mixed on that. Uh, but, but with regard to sh could we predict that this student will now be more successful in life because they went to an alternative school? Probably not. Uh, the alternative school is probably more beneficial to the general public school than it is to the students that go to the alternative school. And we want to have a range of those possibilities for kids because there are some kids that truly need those. <clears throat> I think what, what Justin and I worry about is not are there kids in alternative schools, but are there kids in alternative schools that are there because we never did the things we could have done to make them successful? That's the big shame of it. And if you look at the data, that's really the reality for a lot of those kids. We saw them when they were very young having problems. We saw them when they were having problems a little bit later in life. And if you look and see what was done for them, all that was done was suspending them, sending them home, et cetera. And as Justin said, we've got absolutely no evidence that that will change behavior. And if that's the only thing we do, then you're going to put a lot of kids in alternative schools. Mm -hmm. And, and it, uh, it doesn't work. It, it's what you're saying. So <laughs> Jefferson County and others may want to change their approach, or is well, that you the have only to thing have they can it do? Because like Justin said, you get these kids that are violent, et cetera. They've grown to that point, and there are some kids that are just going to be that way no matter what, a very small percentage. So you have to have these alternative settings, but, but it shouldn't be your solution. It should be this is what we're stuck with because everything else we tried didn't work. Yeah, and, and, and if I could just add to it, you also have to live, JCPS and every other school system in this country has to live within federal law, and federal law mandates that there are, there's a continuum of placement options for, for students. What we want to see happen, though, is that we're, we do everything we can in, in their general education school setting before we look at those other options. 
Now, if that may, that may be the best option for su- some students, and if it is, and that's the best place for them to receive their education, then, then so be it, and that's good. And we do have to have those options. So there's, there's a legal side to this as well that we have to live within. And you guys have some research going on right now uh, in regards to uh, the study of teacher-student interactions, correct? And what, what is that? What are you doing? We've looked at, <clears throat> we actually go sit in classrooms and watch what teachers and students do. Both Justin and I have been teachers and, and been special ed teachers and worked with kids with behavior disorders. But we sit and watch what teachers do and what students do. And we've got about 7,000 of those observations now, which I, I believe we're probably the biggest in the world in terms of that right now. Um, and what we know is that it's very predictable. If a student does A and a teacher does something in return, we can then predict based upon what the teacher did what the kid will do next. So we know there are simple probabilities. And if, if we were going to Las Vegas and betting on this, we could say, when the kid does this, if you do this intervention rather than this one, you get a better shot at being successful. But what we're also finding is those things that give us the highest probability of success are not the things teachers do most often. Such as? What things do teachers <laughs> not do that they should be doing? What we'd like to see teachers do is move slowly over to a student and ask a question. What would be a better way to do that? And then lead the student through a series of questions to set them up to be successful. <clears throat> okay. What we typically see instead is knock it off, which just sets up a confrontation. The kid confronts back, and we get this escalation to where the kid ends end up leaving the room. Yeah. We'd like to see more, more what we call opportunities to respond. We like to see student, teachers asking students a lot of questions and, and engaging them in the, in the interaction. What we see happen is as, as teachers increase opportunities and questions and giving students a chance to respond, student engagement increases. And as student engagement increases, disruptive behaviors go down. It's a natural byproduct of that. So So the bottom line for this is for teachers, ask the kids questions, get them engaged, get them to answer the questions. Is right. that, I mean, that's a simple, simplified psychology there. But <laughs> Don't even have to be questions. It, it can even be just commands. Hey, show me what that would look like. Hey, you know, it's again, it comes back to really it's what teachers do. If, if the kid won't be engaged, then the teacher has to change their behavior to get them to be engaged because the kids aren't just going to magically change. And like I said, it, it really comes down to probability. It's easy to say, try these things or do these things. I don't have a, a dog in the hunt, neither does Justin, other than, hey, the probability says that you're better light, you have a better likelihood of getting it to work doing this than this. And I assume to wrap things up here that uh, you're teaching your students at the University of Louisville that want to be future teachers, that you're teaching them these uh, methods to deal with these troublesome kids, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. You're in special ed at UofL. You're you're hearing all this. (laughs) Just doing that right before we walked over here. All right. Very good. (laughs) Terry Scott, Justin Cooper from the College of Education and Human Development at the University of Louisville. Thanks for being on the show. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. All right. When we return, what does blood do in space in zero gravity? We'll talk about it. This is UofL Today with Mark Ebert on 93.9 The Bill. My name is Alan. I'm a uh, senior public health major here at UofL. I have to say that my UofL experience has been absolutely terrific. I've received all the support in the world that I could that I could ever ask for. I want every student that comes through these doors um, of the university to have a similar experience and to get involved and to feel like they are a part of something and to develop their passions um, and to take that, graduate from the university and, and contribute and give back to their community. Um, go Cards. This is our time to soar. We are an unstoppable force of innovation and academic excellence. Solving the world's mysteries through research, stimulating growth in our community and beyond, and inspiring the next generation of leaders to build a better future for all of us. We are the University of Louisville. Watch us take flight. Welcome back to UofL Today with Mark Hebert on 93.9 The Bill. Glad you're joining us today. Sitting here with me is Speed School of Engineering Professor Stu Williams, who is preparing to go into space and up to the space station. (laughs) All right. I may have lied just a tad. Uh, Not him personally. (laughs) He's not going anywhere. But his experiment and his research is headed that way to the space station. Right now, both are still on Earth, and Stu is here in Louisville in a radio studio to talk about it. So, Stu, welcome. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. All right. Well, let's talk about, uh, first of all, what do you do at the Speed School of Engineering? What do you teach? I'm in the mechanical engineering department. I've been there um, for about five years now, assistant professor there. Um, So I teach different levels, uh, undergraduate and graduate level, focusing on fluid dynamics and, and dynamics in general, the thermal fluid systems, if you will. But I also 
my research interests are that field of study, but at the micro scale and the nano scale. All right. So small stuff. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right. And, and it's the fluid that we're talking about going up uh, onto the space station. So tell me about this project where you're sending some sort of experiment up to the space station. I will. Um, first, let's start with, I'm going to use the term colloid. And what a colloid is, it's a fancy term for a particle that is in suspension. So if you have a colloidal solution, you have a series of particles homogeneously floating in a solution. It's likely that a majority of our audience have consumed a colloidal solution today. Such as? Tea, coffee, milk. If they're a vampire, blood. <laughs> so all of these are colloidal solutions that are important to industry. Say your pharmaceuticals, um, cosmetics, um, the detergents. And... Industry in particular is interested in colloidal stability. And when I mean stability, it's not in, oh, it's, it's unstable, we're going to have an explosion. It's not that. It's more of you want these particles to remain dispersed. You want them to remain in suspension. You don't want them to aggregate. You don't want that. So we look at, uh, and there's different scientists um, that, that look at how particles interact with each other, but yet stay stable. So if you have a detergent, say Procter & Gamble, make a product and you have this best detergent in the world, but yet if you sit it on a shelf or if it sits in a week in your, wa in your uh, clothes wash room and it starts to separate, well, bad things happen. Either the product doesn't perform well or maybe it ruins your clothes. So they want to look at different stabilization mechanisms and that's where my research comes in. Um, so, so that just gives you the background of colloids and what, when I say the term stability, mm -hmm. that's what we refer to. Um, but what we want to do is we are studying a particular stabilization mechanism called nanoparticle haloing. So before I get into that, <laughs> yeah, that's a big word. Yeah, that's uh, <laughs> big phrasing. But, uh, usually if you have a particle that's in a suspension, the, it has a charge, there's a surface charge, there's a chemical reaction that occurs. Even if you have glass particles in, a, in water, you have a chemical charge that is on the surface. So particles are typically charged. And if you have two particles that are the same, meaning they have the same charge, they repel each other. Mm -hmm. But in some cases, the particle doesn't have a charge on the surface. It's, it's neutral, we'll say. And if you have two particles or more that are neutral, and then they get in close um, proximity to each other, there's something called a van der Waals attraction. <laughs> yes, big words today. Now you're losing <laughs> me here. You're losing me here. So. You have an attraction between particles. And okay. when particles aggregate, they sediment, bad things happen and especially from the product standpoint. And usually what, what we are looking at is we want to avoid the aggregation. We want to avoid the sedimentation. And even the particles that we are looking at, which is why we're going to do experiments on the space station, is that generally if they're large enough for you to see, even under a microscope, they sediment, they settle. So it's tough for us to look at and to test and to research these interactions, no matter, no matter what these mechanisms may be. Okay. Well, let me, let me back yeah. you up a little bit. Go for it. Let me back you up a little bit. Um, so uh, this, this experiment that you're mm -hmm. sending to the space station, first of all, when, when is this experiment going and how is it getting up to the space station? Mm -hmm. Originally, it was scheduled on SpaceX 8, um, but due to rescheduling uh, with respect to the SpaceX 7 incident that happened earlier in the summer this year, uh, we are now on Orb 4. We have one, uh, and that's launched. Orb 4 is a rocket. Yes, and that is being launched on December 3rd, assuming the schedule remains as it is. And then that's our first of three planned experiments that are occurring over a period of, we'll say, five years or okay. so. And okay, each so one is a different phase when we'll learn some stuff from our first experiment he'll help us plan the next experiment and of course you can't do all this in weeks <laughs> it makes very methodical planning and doing this and how did the university of louisville i mean you wouldn't think you know this landlocked university in the river city in, in the midwest uh, would have anything to do with nasa so <laughs> how did the university of louisville uh and and your project get on the space station well my research team com first comprises of researchers from western kentucky University of Kentucky and the University of Louisville. And we also have a collaborative partner in Procter and & Gamble. And the entity that we are collaborating with, with respect to NASA, is the Glenn Research Center. There's a group up there um, that they uh, call themselves the Advanced Colloids Experiments. So they have this microscope, and there's tons of different things on the International Space Station. It's a national lab. Um, and we are looking at, it, we, we posed a research question to a call-out from NASA, 
And they have research competition, proposal competition. So our proposal was chosen in the NASA EPSCOR competition. Um, but we are really excited to, to get this up there and to start our testing. All right, we're talking with Stu Williams from the Speed School of Engineering at the University of Louisville. We're talking about his project to send a uh, or research project uh, that's going up to the space station um, in December. So uh, talk a little bit about what types of, you call them colloids, I'm going to call mm -hmm. them liquids because that's, that, that's my <laughs> term. Uh, that you're going to be studying, or they're going to be studying up on the space station. Is, are we talking blood? Are we talking uh, detergent? Uh, what are we <laughs> talking about that is going up on the space station? We are doing a fundamental study of how two neutral particles interact. So I referred to earlier, if you have a neutral particle solution, that's not good. Generally, you have attraction, bad things happen. So we are looking at a unique research avenue of introducing very, very small charged particles, one hundredth of the diameter of the larger particles that we're looking at. So the size ratio, just to put that perspective, is if you have a tennis ball and you have the ball in a ballpoint pen, that's about a hundred to one ratio. So we're looking at that with nanoparticles, small nanoparticles that are charged, and if you throw in enough of them, they form a halo of charge around the large particles, and that effect gives it a charge such that now everything's stable. Now all the particles have a net charge, and we're looking at the fundamental investigations of that. So we don't have a specific, say, detergent or product that we are studying, but we are hopeful in making fundamental discoveries that can help lead to eventual products. And what would be the, and well, let me back up. Hmm. What would be the reason for sending it in a zero-gravity environment? Why do you have to do it in space? Why can't you just figure this stuff out on, hmm. on land, on Earth? Mm -hmm. Generally, if the particle is large enough for us to visually see, even under a microscope, it will settle. And on the International Space Station environment, they have, I can't say no gravity. Uh, that's one of the first statements I said. NASA, correct me on it. It's microgravity. So one millionth. Virtually the, zero gravity. Virtually zero gravity. Uh, gravity is negligible there. So these are very weak interactions that we want to look at. So if we want to make these fundamental discoveries... We want to eliminate all other external factors. And on Earth, one of those factors is gravity. Okay. All right. And the practical impact or the what could be the practical applications, depending on what you learn up in space? I think you had mentioned in an email to me something about um, the solar panels, the mm -hmm. way, to, way to better make some solar panels or something. So mm -hmm. tell me, what could be the practical impact on Earth? Well, there are several examples. And since we are doing a fundamental study, we could apply this to pharmaceutical products, detergent products. We need to understand the science behind it first in order to apply it properly in the future. But we are there are some avenues that we are pursuing actively with uh, collaborators in Western Kentucky. We are seeing if we can use this to assemble particles. So particles are so small, if you want to use them as building blocks, you can't just reach in there and grab them and move them around. You can't do that. They're very, very tiny. So there is a field of research called colloid self-assembly. So you put all these colloids in your liquid, and then they assemble some structure that you want. So not only are we looking at how particles are stable and they don't form structures, we also want to look at how they form structures using the same type of experiment. So with the solar panels, if the particles are arranged in a certain lattice structure, it actually enhances the capabilities of that solar cell because the particles themselves, the diameter of the particles themselves, are on the order of the wavelength of light. Are any of your students helping you with any of this uh, research? Yes, yes. We have a team of undergraduate and graduate students, not just in my lab, but also a collaborator in chemical engineering, Jerry Willing, uh, the uh, chemistry collaborator, Western Kentucky, Hamali. Um, that we have a good team put together with respect to knowing the chemistry aspect of it, actually creating these particles to the interaction between them and the fluid dynamics of it as well. Last question. Do you really want to go up in a rocket? <laughs> Would you like to do that? Mm, I don't know. I'm, I, I have mixed feelings about that. But they do have a good, uh, say, the, the scientists and the astronauts on the International Space Station, um, they have a strong military background, but some also have a strong science and engineering background as well. So You'd think I'll about have it. to think about it. All right. All right. Stu Williams from the Speed School of Engineering, thanks for coming on. Appreciate it. Thank you. I appreciate it. All right. After the break, a news conference to announce a huge federal grant for UofL and this community to curb youth violence in Louisville. We'll talk about that when we come back on UofL Today with Mark Hebert on 93.9 The Bill. 
My name is Taylor Young and I'm a secondary education major with a minor in Pan-African Studies and my U of L is knowing that I chose to come to a university where there are so many opportunities. Some of the things that I have experienced here at U of L are being on the Porter Executive Board and also just singing in the Black Diamond Choir. My U of L is knowing that I'm continuing a legacy that my parents set out for me when they both graduated from this university and my U of L is always being a Cardinal. Go Cards! This is our time to soar. We are an unstoppable force of innovation and academic excellence. Solving the world's mysteries through research, stimulating growth in our community and beyond, and inspiring the next generation of leaders to build a better future for all of us. We are the University of Louisville. Watch us take flight. is not only a campus, but it's a home. It's a home where I've made countless memories and friendships. It's a home where I've not only flourished as a person, but I've also grown as a student. U of L has given me something that I cannot thank any more for, is my future. So thank you U of L for giving me my own special, unique experience. My own U of L. Go Cards. Welcome back to U of L today with Mark Heber. Glad you're joining us today. On Friday, November 20th, there was a news conference. It was held in West Louisville to announce a $5.7 million grant from the U.S. Center for Disease Control to the University of Louisville School of Public Health and Information Sciences. That grant award will help identify and figure out solutions to youth violence problems in West Louisville. So here are some sound clips from that news conference, starting with the dean of UofL School of Public Health, Craig Blakely. It's going to be a fairly complex project uh, with lots of different people engaged, which makes it even that much more complex. Uh, but that's the, the nature of what's got to come together in order to really make a difference. And so we're, we're really excited about the entire team uh, that's going to make this happen. The grant money will set up the U of L Youth Violence Prevention Research Center. So here's Mayor Greg Fisher, Center Director Monica Wendell, and U of L Executive Vice President for Health Affairs David Dunn, starting with the mayor. When we think about how our young folks are looking at us, what are we doing? Establishing uh, the U of L Youth Violence Prevention Research Center uh, was a big signal to our young folks that each and every person in our community counts, and we're doing something about it. We want the potential to each and every, we want the potential of each and every one of our citizens thriving and flourishing. That's how we define compassion here in our city. It's an action word. What are you doing to help everybody's potential to thrive? So we're very excited about this being another arrow in our quiver for a safe and healthy city. I look forward to the results of this partnership between Vanderbilt, my alma mater, uh, the U of L, the CDC, and the Office for Safe and Healthy ne Neighborhoods, and of course the youth, youth Voices Against Violence. I think this initiative is going to have a tremendous impact in the lives of our citizens, and I look forward to the results we have here so we can share them with the rest of the country as well. So today marks the day that we're going to try something different. Um, this CDC grant and the establishment of the Youth Violence Prevention Research Center here at U of L is going to bring multiple disciplines to the table with young people to change the narrative. I believe, I heard from Theo Edmonds this morning, and we're trying to verify, this is the first time artists have ever been brought in to this kind of research um, that's funded by CDC. And we're excited about that. Um, we will bring young people to the table to figure it out. This $5.7 million grant from the CDC uh, is, to me, an amazing grant. It will be a, uh, a way that we have a platform uh, for making things better in the West End and other areas. Uh, it probably will uh, lead to many more grant extensions uh, because I think this work is going to uh, be very effective as I understand it. That was some of the news conference which was held back on Friday, November 20th, announcing a federal grant to identify strategies to curb youth violence in West Louisville. So that'll pretty much wrap up this edition of UofL Today with Mark Hebert. But before we go, just a little tidbit about UofL. Did you know that UofL has been named a military-friendly school for 2015 by GI Jobs? It's a monthly magazine designed to help veterans make the transition from military service to the civilian workforce, and this is the seventh year in a row the UofL has been named a military-friendly school. 
You can find podcasts of all these shows on SoundCloud. I'd like to thank all of our listeners on 93.9 The Ville and Metro TV viewers. And remember, always, go Cards. Go Cards.